Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Matthew Marsden Show. This is Marsden Mondays, and I've got a very special treat for you guys today. A very good friend of mine, a medieval historian and Tolkien expert, Mr. Michael Grombine. Welcome to the show, Michael. Matthew, thank you for having me on. Um, it's We've known each other for a very long time, but this is it's great to see you jumping into the uh, the YouTube uh, the personal YouTube space because it's your 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 personal podcast, which is awesome. Yeah, it's kind of, you I know up you your, know um, episode on the Shroud of Turin. Yeah, well, you know it's funny because I mean you, you know you've known me for a long time now, and you know that I you know I resisted these things as as long as I could, and then you know after a while people are like why you know you got to do it you got to do it. So I was like okay, all right, I'll go and do it. So and it's a lot of fun because I get to. I get to talk to my friends, you know, and, and get awesome. to introduce them to a, a whole new audience. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. So even though here is across the country from you. Well, I know, right? Well, but, but just so you guys know, Michael was out. Uh, I'm, I was with him. He came and stayed at my house this week. And we had a great time as usual. And, uh, and, and I said to him, because we, we started... I'll let you talk about yourself in a minute. You know, I know you're not an actor, but I'm sure you can talk about yourself a little bit. But we... Um, we would we me and michael we never have like kind of trivial conversations ever i don't think we've ever had a trivial conversation um and That's we started a, talking sorry but bold bold claim there no. I, I mean i i can't answer for all for the conversations after <laughs> 3 3 a.m when i've had a lot of uh, a, a few quite a few pints but uh I'll, I'll take your word for it yeah no they're, they're all very very interesting well at least i think they are and um and we started talking because we you know we Michael, you're an expert on medieval history, um, but we started talking about Tolkien, something that is uh, a, a, a subject that is very dear to both of our hearts. Me having to have gone to the same school as Tolkien, and as I tell everyone, I grew up in Mordor. And so can you, can you just introduce, again, talk about your podcast, let us know yep. a little bit about you so um, and, and your history. I So no worry, no worries. I sorry, I think I lost you there for a second. But but uh, so I am, as you said, I, I got a wonderfully uh, useful degree in medieval history um, many years ago, and uh, I it's a business I'm no longer in. I wish I wish I were. I'd probably retire to it. But uh, I'm in the world of business now. But but I'm, Tolkien has been one of the great loves of literary loves of my life, um, and uh, first read him when I was eight years old. Actually, I. Uh, my, I sat down on the couch one summer and I saw these books and I picked up the first one and I started reading and I read for four days straight, um, read all three books. My mother thought there was something wrong with me. Uh, she was correct. There is something wrong with me. And and uh, and so that was my first exposure to, you know, I was at eight going on nine years old. And so ever since then, I've I've made a habit. I, I have um an inordinate number of children as as do you sir and and i make a habit every three or four years of reading the whole cycle and then i from the hobbit and the lord of the rings to them and then i after the four years are up i start over again because the kids that were too young for it are now not too young for it and so uh so i think i've read this the whole series about 21 times this is my 20 wow. uh, going on 21st second time um but i'm also a fan of all of his other legendarium and uh, so the podcast that i do is with a gentleman one of the earliest web journalists um when the movies started coming out in 99 his name is jonathan watson and his website is the one ring.com so if anyone wants to take a look um it's one of the more popular uh, lord of the ring sites out there uh not to be confused with uh the one ring.net which is which is a, a different group of folks with whom we do not always agree <laughs> but uh, such is such is the nature of uh, the world of nerddom but uh, we so we have a little podcast we do every week uh called exploring tolkien and uh we started off um a year and a half ago on this right before the rings of power um came on the scene and mm. Mm. I think I think our podcast, yeah, is right. Our podcast can be best described as the anti Rings of Power podcast. I mean, there are far more famous people than I am that uh, that, that are podcasts that have that have popped off against uh, Rings of Power. But 
essentially what we do is we go through Tolkien's works and both his um, his main ones that everyone knows about, but also the lesser known ones, including Unfinished Tales and Lost Tales and um, some of his essays, the essay on fairy stories being a pivotal one that I wish more people knew about because it, it gives you Tolkien's whole uh, theory about how to write fantasy. And he was kind of the author of modern fantasy. Um, and uh, and so, but all those sorts of things. And then we take breaks and we review. Right now we're going, we're doing a series we're on episode 28 or so of a, se a series of shorts where we look at every single change made by Peter Jackson in the Jackson films and compare it to all the changes made from Tolkien's books. Um, granted that, and, and as you know, you know, there's, this is the world of movies and in the world of cinema, if you're going to take a book, you're going to have to make changes. Um, when you put it on screen, there just, there isn't a way to, to um, trans, uh, transcribe a book directly on the screen. So, so our look is like, you know, how true to the spirit of Tolkien is, is or, or were Jackson's changes that he made? Do we think they were good for the screen or not? So we, we kind of intersperse our, our episodes based on reading the actual works of Tolkien and then going back to uh, some of the more pop culture things. Our greatest fame was, was during the Rings of Power because we, we, um, we spent a long time tearing in a new one, um, basically every episode, because they're, that, the folks involved in that, I just... I know, I know, I know, I know. I don't want to get your your podcast in trouble, sir. But uh, they they had no concept of the heart of Tolkien, none whatsoever. Well, so, so let let's let's talk about that because, well, firstly, I want to talk about the man, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, you know they they've been talking. There's a lot of talk about Tolkien and what his influences were, and one of the things that the the powers that be seem to love to leave out is his faith. Indeed. Because that that was an absolute central part of uh, his fantasy writing, actually. That's exactly, uh, and right. all of his writing, actually, right? Exactly right. And um, there was a Tolkien biopic in 2019 that came out. That was a good example of that, where um, just called Tolkien, um, and and so our your listeners or and uh, viewers may have seen it, and it's um. It was a good example where they did a lot of good in that in that biopic. It was a it was interesting, um, and it was fairly well acted. I thought um, I'm not an actor, so I, my my uh, my opinion doesn't matter as much. But I thought it was all right. But they completely left out his faith. I mean, it was basically entirely gone from it. And if you want to understand Tolkien and you want to want to understand what makes his works enduring. A massive piece of that puzzle has to be his faith. There are basically two things, well, three, two or three things that you have to understand that I think people mostly miss when they when they're um, trying when they're reading Tolkien. Nobody denies that Tolkien is highly, uh, his works are highly attractive. They've stood the test of time for the past, and now it, now we're going on seventy years um, and well more because The Hobbit was well, well, well before that. So we're we're for eighty or ninety years for The Hobbit. But um, but seventy years for the Lord of the Rings themselves, and so everyone knows he's popular. But if you after try to answer the question of why is that the case, why is he so popular? You have to dig in deeper, you know, because there's been hundreds of of fantasy authors since him, and a lot of them trying to copy him to one extent or another, and borrowing from him. And some of them are very popular, like for example George R. R. Martin and such. Um, but the quality of Tolkien's work <clears throat> and what makes it enduring relies on a couple of principles that I think a lot of people forget. One is his faith. It is deeply rooted in his faith. His, his, he even admits so in one of his letters, I think letter 133, to, back to his fans, where he says, he says that, you know, this is an, you know, the Lord of the Rings was uh, essentially and primarily a Christian work at first conscious unconsciously and then later consciously huh. um, and and then so he's there's that part of it where and his faith is all throughout there's so many <clears throat> images there's so many uh principles of his world which are based on his catholic faith because he was a catholic um not just a christian and so he you know to try to cut that out is cutting out a kind of heart one of the hearts anyway of, of Tolkien. The other aspect, which I think people forget most, and I don't think they relate to it most, comes from, well, let me put it this way. Um, 
There's a quote from Sam Gamgee on the stairs of Kirith Ungol in the Two Towers, at the end of the Two Towers. And he and Frodo are talking about the, the great stories and musing about how they suppose they're in one of these stories. And, um, you know, a lot of their conversation, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful scene. And, and Peter Jackson did it, did it some credit with his movie take, but I would encourage everyone to read the book, ver, um, the actual, because it's a lot fuller. It has more, more to it. But in it, what essentially you find is that the hobbits themselves, the, the lesson about the people that are in epics, they're imagining themselves in, they're realizing that they're, they're players in this great drama that's unfolding this epic and this struggle against a great evil. But their attitude towards it is one of, well, we almost wish we weren't here. And I suppose everyone that wishes, that was in such stories wishes they weren't here, but you, have, you don't. You don't have a choice in that. You just have to do what you can um, in the moment. And with the, well, there's the whole, the famous phrase about do what you can with, with the time given you, which is Gandalf statement, but it relates to that. And so it's very similar. And then they talk about the connection to the Silmarillion and, and which is something that makes Tolkien's work great to get. That's the third element that I haven't mentioned yet, but it's the, but what makes Sam and Frodo different from any other, if you compare them, for example, to a, a, a character in George R.R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, um, the characters in George R.R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, there, you, you will rarely find one. There might be arguably one or two, and I, I'll, I'll go to war with people about this because uh, there, there are a couple that might have something like this characteristic. But what Sam and Frodo have, and that Tolkien realized and, and was key to, uh, to his idea of a hero, is humility. And, and the idea that they aren't the main, you know, the, all the videos nowadays about the main character, you can find, you know, someone, so-and-so thinks they're the main character in, in, a, in, in the current, uh, you know, whatever's going on around them and everyone else is just an NPC. So Frodo and Sam are, are heroes who are humble. And they have that virtue of humility, which is a very Christian um, virtue and very opposite of most other epics, even great epics like the Song of Roland or Beowulf or the Iliad or the Odyssey. Humility is not a is not a, um, a an admired virtue, or at least um, not usually. But that's at the heart. Aragorn himself, the king, right? The return of the king is about Aragorn, who is the king. He himself is humble um, throughout, even though he takes his rightful place. He doesn't, he's not going to, he's not, he, he isn't the uh, simpering Aragorn that Peter Jackson presents us with. He is actually, um, he's actually responsible and very masculine in, in that sense in, in Tolkien's books. But he still exhibits humility um, it, with, in reference to the people that he's dealing with at every turn. And, and that's what real heroes have, is this sense, and, to, and that's all throughout Tolkien, and I can't find it almost anywhere in any epic written since. Fantasy, sci-fi, um, doesn't matter. There are almost no heroes that have true humility. So anyway, that was a big rant, but that's one no, of the No, no, it's the, great. It, no, it's, it's great. It's kind of the second and, principle. Yeah, and, and we, we also, when you were here last week, we were talking about why Tolkien was such an effective writer um, not only because clearly he was a brilliant man, but also his experiences, experiences. in the war, yes. where he came from, uh, again, his faith, all these things were balled up together to create the man who could write something like this. And I think that we'll probably never see that ever again. <clears throat> Unlikely. Probably never see it, right? I, I and, can... Can I you talk say, to that? Can you talk to that about that a little bit, Michael? About those right, you things. Know, it's I love how you point that out because that's we we Jonathan Watson and I, my co-host on the podcast, tackle this question in various forms on a semi-regular basis. And and after Rings of Power is a big question in everyone's mind. Why is the Rings of Power such trash? Why can't they do Tolkien's legacy um, in in a way that that is that is admirable or at least you know, somewhat consonant with, with, what, with what the great man wrote. And I think it boils down to a lot of what you said. What made Tolkien the man he was was a combination of factors. You know, here's a man who watched most of his friends die in the trenches of World War I. And that we know in the trenches of World War I was when he first began his, his um, world building. 
the of Middle Earth. And so it wasn't he wasn't writing the Lord of the Rings stories yet. That was many decades later, but he would began building the world, which and in notes that would then later on find themselves in the Silmarillion. And so so you have this man who is deeply affected by the war and the ravages of war and sees it, but he doesn't buckle to it. He he faces it and it 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 wounds him um in a way, but he uses it and uses it as the grist for the mill of what would later become his great stories. But then that's not enough. You can't just have a soldier who who faces virtuously the, the evils of war. You then have to add in this faith that I talked about. You then have to add in the fact that he was, um, especially throughout his, most of his career that we know him, he was an Oxford Don. He was he was one of the, um, he is in fact, his translation of Beowulf is still one of the top three translations in the world. He was the, he was a, a, um, a first rate uh, Anglo-Saxon scholar and he spoke nine languages and um, he was a philologist. So you have to have this academic thing where he can actually build realistic languages and, and any new history so he could build realistic histories. He could, as what the word that he would later call, use about what we would call writing fantasy was sub-creation, mm -hmm. which is the ability to create a world inside of your imagination. He called it sub-creation because he believed that what God does is create from nothing what the power we have, which is closest to that, is to create from nothing but only in our imaginations. So with the tools that he gives us, we can create a world from nothing in our imaginations. And if we do it well, we can make it so realistic that people can enter into it in our literature and they can be captivated by it. Um, not in an unhealthy way, but just in, in the way that one does in a great story. So you have to have all these factors. You have to have the educated man. You have to have the family man. He was a deeply fam um, uh, inspired family man and devoted. He, you have to have a man who understands war. He understands love. He understands sacrifice and suffering. He is uh, highly educated. He understands history and languages. I, I agree with you. I don't think it can happen. And now you have to compare that to the rings of power and their point. They even said it, they told it to us before they made the, move, the the TV show, was that their intention was a couple, twofold, or at least there were two major themes that they mentioned. One was that they wanted to write the, the work that Tolkien never wrote, which is a presumption. It is a deep, arrogant presumption that you can go in and just write. You know, Tolkien couldn't write this story, but I can. I can go in and, and write a story in his world that he never wrote, you know, as if it can ever stand on par with it. So they're not trying to stay true to him. They're just trying to do what he couldn't do, is there? And then the second presumption was that they had to make sure that the, the, the world that they presented to us was one where everyone could see themselves in it. So you have things like... Um, ethnically diverse elves and and dwarves and like it's just DEI all over Tolkien's world, which which um and I you know deep like a year and a half ago we covered the idea of you know what what's going on with this stuff. There's the whole political angle. Plenty of podcasts about that. What we had to say about it was for, was more simple, which is you're failing at sub creation if you if you if you think that you can make a good work by just injecting your values into another man's work and making and just changing a bunch of stuff that makes no sense and everything should be okay because the feels and um, that's why i mean that's it's, it's just a it's just a third it's a third or fourth well, you know, rate work rings you know I mean, the, 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 and the, um I'm sad Michael, about it. The, well the, the the strange thing is when you talk about the humility of frodo you see that there's a complete lack of humility in Hollywood. So, right, right. you know, you look at the virtues of a hero, and look, the Lord of the Rings fans, uh, the, the fantasy lot, you know, I got to go to a Comic-Con with Gary, uh, Nedrotic, you know, um, yep. Jay, like all, all, that, all that team, Ryan Cannell. And what I saw there was a bunch of, really amazing people that really really loved they really loved the material and they, they and they're dismissed a lot of the time they're they're spoken about like there's some kind of like subcategory and it's absolutely not true i mean these people know the the books back to front uh they're very very loyal and 
they were just again it's the same thing with the mcu and with star wars they're kind of told that because they they know the material more than these are better than these writers and then they're told when they're calling them on it which is all they're doing is they're respecting the law right they're respecting that that's right and they're told that they are they're called all kinds of names. Let's just put it like that. They're called all right. kinds of names. Right. We're problematic it, because we care about the, the, the world that Tolkien made, and we don't just blindly accept the tripe that we get from, from Reeks of Power. That's right. Well, well, here's the other thing. Like I said, there's a lack of humility, which I think I told you before when I spoke to C.S. Lewis's son, how, they, how when he first went to Hollywood, they were like, we're going to change it. We're going we're gonna to do Lord, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And they're in L.A. And, and Edmund is flicking through CDs at Tower Records. I'm like, what are you thinking? I mean, it's just such a terrible idea. But, but more than that, it's the same thing when people put shock value into movies, whether it's with nudity or sex or whatever. It's because ultimately they don't have the chops, right, to write something compelling enough for us to want to watch it. So I think it's the same with The Rings of Power. They, they actually cannot write like Tolkien. They, they don't have the talent. Look, it's okay. He's one of the greatest writers of all time, if not the greatest writer of all time. Right. So it's okay, like not being able to get there, right? As long as you're in that kind of in that world and you respect it, like like you say about Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson had to make, and we can talk about Faramir in a little while, but that you know that <laughs> Peter Jackson had to make certain decisions. But the fans are kind of like he did it in the in the spirit of Tolkien, you know, we, we, we understand that you have to make certain decisions and some people might be pissed off about that, but he didn't throw it out the window. He didn't say, this is it. I am God and I'm going to change it. Yep. And one of the, one of the famous quotes that Jackson had and uh, Gary from New Rock was, I love, I love his take on this whole thing. And, uh, and, and he, he actually gave us, gave us a shout out during the midst of the whole rings of power thing to our podcast, because we were one of the, we're on his team. We're all we're all on the same team, I should say. But but um, he was, you know, Jackson was was adamant that they were not there to put their own politics into it, and they were just there to tell the story that Tolkien told. And they had some changes that they made, and you know, some of them I didn't even like, and a lot of them were great. And um, but and some of them they felt they had to for for short for reasons of space and such. But no problem. But Jackson wasn't there to impose his views. And I think that's what you're, I agree with you on. There's, that's, that's a certain humility that I respect in a, in a filmmaker. And what Jackson will have always is he will have that recognition of the great films that he made because he's a great filmmaker. He wasn't trying to put himself on the level of Tolkien as a storyteller. He was trying to tell Tolkien's story on film, which, which is... Uh, which he did, I think, a great job of, and so and so. Yep, I agree. And I don't think the Rings of Power folks have the same humility. I don't think, but I don't even think. I think you're right. They don't have the same talent level. I don't even think they understand why they don't have the same talent level. I I think that there's there's a cluelessness in a lot of ways to the modern corporate mind and the whole DEI um, moves that people make inside of the corporate world, where I just don't think Amazon has it in its DNA to write a good Middle Earth story. Uh, the, the, having worked in the corporate world for more than a decade and a half, I can tell you that the corporate world is about only a couple things, one of which is making money. And they will, and Tolkien's intent when he's writing his books is not to make money. I'm not saying he wasn't happy with the money he made. I'm just saying his primary job, as he saw it, was to create a compelling story, and he did so at a level and with a depth and richness that few could match. And so he, it, it, that was, but the purpose of Amazon, make money. And so they're just going to try to do whatever they can to appease what they think the people want, or or the people that are yelling in their ear anyway. And uh, I just don't, I just, it's totally different levels. They can't, they can't match it. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish I'd, I'd, uh, I should I should have gone to a Comic Con or two during that time, but uh, I wasn't in yeah, the yeah. area back then. But not anymore. Well, you know the funny thing is, you can make a lot of money if you just stick to the story. 
<laughs> well, like, the... I mean, uh, but Peter Jackson did it. He stuck to the story pretty much, and he won a ton of Oscars, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the movies are still selling today. I mean, I went out and I bought them again the other day for my kids to watch. So th- they keep selling. And by the way, they've aged nice. very, very well. I mean, that, that is a um, – it, it's, it's really a sign of a great filmmaker and a great team. And, of course, I mean, I work with – both Jonathan Reese Davis, he played my dad in um, in Helen of Troy. I know what oh, with true. Orlando on Black Hawk Down, and he, he was like, oh, I just went off and I did this thing, Lord of the Rings, and it was kind of crazy because I knew that it was going to be massive, right? But he he was still – that was his – it was his, like, fifth movie because he, he did a movie before he did Lord of the Rings, then he did those three, and then he did Black Hawk Down. And, of course, then he, he blew up and – and went to, uh, and I saw him at the Pirates of the Caribbean, but they they all really respected the work. Um, right. and, and as far as Amazon is concerned, I mean, look, I've done an Amazon show, uh, and they actually got it right on that. Uh, that was Jack Reacher. And oh, right, where, right. Where actually the the original movies with Tom Cruise went away from what Lee Child wanted w- w- had in the books. These have been Skydance went a, a long way to making them exactly like the books. And that's why Skydance are probably the most successful production company right now. But hmm. you're right. I mean, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So when you're in a, in a meeting and someone goes, you know what, you know what we're going to do? We're going to, we're going to expand the universe. And, and look, you know, you and I know this. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not against including people. Right? I just want to say that we're not, not against including people, but, and one of my big, pet peeves as a as a someone in the entertainment industry is why are you taking these established things and bastardizing them and, and and setting people up to fail right because we know that anyone that knows tolkien knows the law knows what he based these characters on uh you know they were more of norse mythology like more, more of those scandinavian mythological and celtic mythological things right and so just wasn't in that world right it just wasn't and we can talk about what that what in a second what i'd love to talk about is what the the elves were meant to be and what the uh, what they were meant to represent uh so on and so forth but what they should have done is create their own fantasy series and brought those elements in it's you know and you can say it's in the spirit of tolkien and people would have just embraced it but if you're saying this is middle earth right this is these are elves these are this these are people know they've read the books and i mean th- these are books that are beloved books by millions of people right. it's not yeah. it's, it, oh, they're it's, not like let me just say this michael they're not like i mean even as far as like game of Th- thrones is concerned it was nowhere near in the same planet sphere as as Lord of the Rings, so you can't get away with that, right? I mean, you can't you can't get away with that in that world. So so, and I I say this over and over again: if you want DEI, if you want black superheroes, write the characters. Don't be lazy. Write them for these characters because you know what. People love Black Panther, right? It it did really, really well. There's no um, protest from people in creating these new characters for more diverse groups. Nobody cares as long as they're written well. But what you don't do, and you've seen this, you saw this with Doctor Who, uh, you've seen it, you saw it with um, – the rings of power and you're seeing it with a bunch of other different shows where they're they're kind of like cramming their their politics into things and people are like this isn't the place for it dude like yeah, if you want to go and do your own thing and go and write your own i mean like the x-men for example the x-men have been you know that they were making statements years ago in the comic books right and the comic books have made statements over the years but write your own now don't be twisting them and bending them these things that that people adore and love and have studied like you said your kids you read them to your kids when they were old and i mean i did the same thing with mine you know I, there comes a point where you realize well hang on it they've got to get over a certain age for them to really engage and really appreciate it but then they'll come back the next year and the the next time the next time the next time and then they start reading them for their kids and it's a exactly. legacy 
Exactly. And then, and people love it. It gets passed down. You know, two things that you were talking about there struck me as you're, as you're saying it. First of all, it's, I agree with you hundred percent. The problem is when they try to take something that exists and they twist it to fit their ends. Let me give you an example of what they could have done. So Tolkien actually has plenty of other lands inside of his larger legendarium. So they could have gone, you know, there's notably everyone knows about the wizards in, in Tolkien's world. Uh, Tolkien talks about how there, there are five Ishtari, um, the, the wizards. Uh, we never know what happens with the other two, Alatar and Palando are their names. They they disappeared into the east. So we have well, the ones we know about are, are Saruman, Gandalf, and Radagast. Um, but uh, there were two blue wizards and they they were, they, they, um, were sent to the east and we don't know what happened to them. Um, so there's these whole continents. There's, there's the Hot of Dream in the south. There's the Easterlings. There's the Variags. There's the Men of Rune. There's all these other nations. They could have done a story of what happened with the wizards in there, for example. Or a lot of things. There was Numenorean settlements. Um, the ancestors of Aragorn settled, uh, had colonies over there. They could have done a story about that. They, like, they could have had plenty of people of any diversity, ethnic diversity. It would have made perfect sense. Tolkien fans would not have had a problem because we love his world. So if you're going to play within his world and you're going to be true to it, we love it. It's not about the skin color. It's about the fact that you're trying to force um, this, this whatever political opinion you have onto what already exists so so um <clears throat> yeah it, that's that's a real problem and they don't i just they just don't get it and i think they underestimated the the uh the, the families too yeah. yeah they really did they you know they and and a lot of times people do it and they talk about people you know doing it with star trek star wars and all these fandoms the tolkien fandom is peculiarly um resilient mm -hmm. to 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 having uh, the the little flashy light waved in our face and being told it's something else. We don't we don't take to gaslighting well, and we don't um, and we also tend to skew a little older. I mean, not that young the young love Tolkien as well. Thanks especially to Peter Jackson's films introducing him to his world. But but there's a lot of Tolkien fans that we just it, it doesn't. We're not going to we're not going to roll over just because and you know you threw some new Jedi at us with with whatever whatever lame backstory you know the force is now female i guess uh, according to the acolyte um so so uh, i mean like you can't just change the lore on us the way you you can with other properties um and we're not going to stand for it so i think they underestimated the backlash it'll be really interesting to see what happens with lord of the ring the rings of power season two which is supposed i heard recently is, is still on track to be released end of this year supposedly so we'll see we'll see if they uh, they didn't admit that they were going to change anything along those lines or they'd done anything wrong, but I think that um, it would, I'd be surprised if they didn't make at least some concessions and try to return a little bit more to the war. Because, again, one of the things that fans hate is ruining characters. And so there are a, there is a character, Galadriel, who is in Lord of the Rings, who is also you know the star of Rings of Power. And the changes made to Galadriel are stunningly terrible. And they reflect one particular view of what it's what it makes like the the, the um, and i'm not making this up this is just for, directly from the rings of power folks they wanted to make her show her to be a powerful woman that's the direct quote from a lot of different a lot of different times but the thing that's hilariously sad to me is anyone that has read lord of the rings and anyone that has read the silmarillion knows galadriel and they know that she is not only a powerful woman, I mean, she's an elf, but a powerful female elf, but she is powerful beyond the power levels of basically almost anyone. She is actually way more powerful than, for example, Gandalf. Um, so as, as an example, if you look in the appendices um, in, the Lord, in The Return of the King, you'll find that at the same time that Sauron was sending armies to attack Minas Tirith and the world of men, he, would, he also sent an army up north to uh, hit the dwarves of Erebor and an army and the men of Dale that up there. So the dwarves and the, and the men fought a battle against another army. And then the elves of Lothlorien got their own massive army thrown at them, um, which they had to fight off by themselves. And in that battle, not only did the elves of Lothlorien defeat this massive army of, of, of orcs from Dol Guldur, the uh, mountain uh, fortress in southern Mirkwood that they all issued from Sauron's old HQ before Mordor, but uh, not only did they beat them, but then the elves marched upon 
um, Dol Guldur, which is essentially, imagine if you could take um, um, a volcano or mountain range and turn it into a fortress. It's like this unbelievably massive fortress that rises above southern Mirkwood. And Galadriel is said that, like the elves couldn't possibly break through from a siege perspective. They just didn't have the the the, the power, you know, the level of uh, the number of troops required. Although they had beaten the York armies, the armies retreated into the old order. So Galadriel literally stands outside the walls and she brings the whole mountain down with her power. She just she just takes everything down and 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 destroys um, this essentially small mountain range. She has one of the three elven rings at this point, but she's basically shows forth her true unbelievable power. So this is already probably the most powerful. She's the most powerful woman on Middle Earth, and probably the the, the maybe the most powerful of the free peoples. Period. You don't need to turn her into some ice troll, sword wielding, um, you know, Xena warrior princess look like to give to show her to be powerful. That just does. It's not necessary, and. And and the, the idea, the fact that they only see one path towards what a powerful woman looks like is sad. Well, they so, think that being anyway, a powerful second woman over, is, I guess, but the, the, they think that being a powerful woman is being a man, which is really weird because that's, right. that's not <laughs> true at all. But but I would like to say this about about Tolkien, which is that the the amazing thing about those books which you don't really have because you mentioned a little bit like the Star Wars, you know, the Force is, Force is female and, and, you know, George Lucas, if you watch the first, there's a great documentary which talks about the editing of Star Wars. And I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating how the editors came in and there was a whole bit at the beginning where Luke Skywalker was looking up and he was seeing, you know, the opening with the Star Destroyer coming over and when they, when they get Leia's right. ship. And he's looking up and he's like, oh, what's that? Look at that. I can blah, 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 blah. And, it, and it's just horrible. It, 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 it's just, it just doesn't work. And the editors came and they stripped it out and they put that famous opening scene, right, with the, with the Star Destroyer coming in, which is just, it's just epic. Um, and I think that there are a lot of great themes that are in Star Wars, but and people can read into things all they want, right? I don't know that uh, George Lucas was really thinking that deeply about all the different roles in, you know, in in that film. I think that he thinks there was good, there was evil. There's these these other kind of like subplots or whatever it might be, but. Right. If you it's look at Lord of, yeah, yeah, he, well, he said that, right? I mean, he, he looked at the Buster Crab things that were on a, uh, on a Saturday morning, that kind of like Flash Gordon vibe. He, he's very open about that. And I'm not saying he's not a genius because clear, clearly he is. But Lord of the Rings, as you said, your kids can read it and they get something out of it. And adults can read it and get something else out of it. And then scholars can read it and get something else out of it. And then linguists, linguists can read. I mean, it is a masterpiece of, it's a multi-layered masterpiece yes. that is so dense, right? It's, it's so dense. And he was so smart that you can't really compare it. I don't know anything else you compare it to. I mean, uh, you know, he's often compared to C.S. Lewis, but I, I think C.S. Lewis is a way better apologist than he is a fiction writer. And I, look, I, I love the Chronicles of Narnia. I love the Screwtape Letters. I think the Screwtape Letters are brilliant. But nothing comes close to Lord of the Rings. I mean, it, it's not even in the same stratosphere for me. Yep, uh, agreed, just, agreed, agreed. Have you read uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy? No, do you know what? I was having a I was having a conversation with a mutual friend of ours. Um, I think I'm broke. No, it keeps coming in and out. By the way, it, it, for you guys watching, we keep having a, a couple of technical problems, but he won't be on the actual podcast when it comes out. But um, but our friend, I was talking to our friend Matt Peterson about that, uh, about how about the the space trilogy. Um, because I had my own little—I don't know if I ever told you—I have told—I have told people this before that I actually went and met with um, with Doug Gresham and spent some time with him. And I am envious. Yeah, and that was pretty cool. He's a pretty cool dude, you know. I mean, you you won 
step away. And of course, just segue in a second, I used to go, because obviously I used to go to school at the Birmingham Oratory, which is where Tolkien used to go to Mass. Uh, awesome. And he lived not far from that. And St. Philip's College, which is where I went for uh, in the UK, it's called Sixth Form College. I'm, I know you, you're you um, familiar with that. He went there. Uh, and, right. and I used to go, they, there used to be a Tolkien store that was in Birmingham Town Centre, High Street, and, and because they nice. used to own a jeweler's. Nice. And uh, yeah, I always used to go up. And you know, in your little like Cro Magnon, like 16 uh, year old brain, I'd be <laughs> like, hang on, there aren't that many Tolkien's around. That's got to be the other guy as well. And I think it was just the family store. And, and recently I went back and it's gone now. You know, they sold it to somebody, which was, which was really sad. Um, but um, right, the Tolkien estate has become something totally different now. And uh, sadly, Tolkien's grandson, Simon Tolkien, is about the worst uh, defender of his grandfather's work that you can imagine. He he was the one that signed off on all the stuff, the Rings of Power stuff. So, uh, not and it's sad. I mean, you can never, you can't. Uh, all things of this world, <laughs> you're never going to be able to protect a legacy like that forever. So. I'm a bit of a realist when it comes to that stuff. But in, in the C.S. Lewis Space Trilogy, the main character, Ransom, is actually based on Tolkien. Like, is that Tolkien right? Is, oh, yeah, he is a philologist. If you read the first one, he's this philologist, loves to wander the countryside. He has these funny um, academic habits. He's an academic. And, and, um, and, uh, and, and Tolkien was furious. He hated yeah, the facts that exactly. Lewis wrote him in as a character um, on the, in the thing. But, but uh, I think Lewis did a pretty good job, you know, and I like this space trilogy, but I agree with you that it isn't on the level of Lord of the Rings. There are very few books. I mean, I know it's going to sound, and, and of course I'm a nerd, so you all, you all can, uh, can dismiss my statements on that basis if you wish, but um, Tolkien's work, like, there are very few people that, as you said, had you can go to on so many different levels and it gives you something new. Every time I read, reread the Lord of the Rings, I find things that I can't remember noticing before. Uh, and that's incredible after reading it 21 times. And uh, we just recently on our podcast did a read through, which will be my seventh of the Silmarillion, which is a fabulous work of basically it's a, it's a history. And a lot of people that read, read Lord of the Rings and like it, can't get make their way through the Silmarillion because it's just such a different kind of book. It's a history book, not a novel. Um, so it so it, it, it attracts a different audience in that regard. But uh, yeah, it's it's his work. He was just a writer of the first order, um, and uh, and I I love it. I and and many other people do too. So and I doubt they're going to have the same opinion of Rings of Power or, or you know twenty years from now or fifty years from now, let alone seventy. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a different. He's in a different level. He's a different. It's yeah. a different kind of author. So I, I do want to ask you about two things, and and I think we've almost gone. A, well, we've gone forty odd minutes now. So I I do want to ask you a couple of things that we sure. spoke about because I think that these are really really important points that are you know kind of it's within the book. It's addressed in the movie, and it can be this one particular thing can be misconstrued, and I want hmm. you to clarify it. Okay. And then, so the first thing is, no man can kill me, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. So I want you to just detail the truth about that because people are, are coming up with all kinds of stuff, you know, like you know, girl bossing back then, and. I want you to talk about that, and next okay. I want you to, and then I want you to talk about Faramir and and why the, it was tragic that there was a certain element that was left out of the movie that you feel would have made it even better. Like it was really, really important that it was in, and I don't know if you know why it wasn't in, but if you could just talk about those two things. So, firstly, talk about no man uh, can kill me, and then about Faramir. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no worries. We're going to really nerd out for all of you that are still <laughs> hanging around. Um, so so uh, the no man scene you're referring to is, of course, the uh, the death of the Witch King of Angmar, who is the most powerful. He's the of the Nazgul, of the nine riders, um, who's now, and he's Lord of the Nazgul. And he is killed by um, a combination of Eowyn and Mary. Um, Mariadach, Randy Book, The Hobbit. And uh, they both 
they they work together and and slay the the the, the ring wraith the the greatest foe the one that was going to match himself against gandalf again this is gandalf the white who's more powerful than the gandalf that that killed the balrog so so um we know this is an opponent probably only second to sauron taken down by eowyn uh, a writer of rohan uh, niece of the king um and she is famously a writer that that um, bristles at the fact that men go to war and so she hides or disguises herself most of your re- your listeners will, have, will know all this but i just thought it's worth going into and at the cr- climactic moment where eowyn is faced off um the witch king has just killed or dealt a death blow to um to her uncle who is the king of the rohirrim he's lying dying on the ground um, and she's she only is standing against him um, Mary is behind him and unnoticed because he's a hobbit and small and insignificant. Um, and then in this climactic moment, the witch king mocks her because she dares to stand against him. And he 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 says um, that he, no man can slay him. And uh, Eowyn, in the movie, removes her helmet and says, I am no man, and then stabs him in the face. And that's after Mariadoc stabs him in the back of the knee. Um, so a couple things to note about that scene. Um, that's been taken as sort of like Tolkien. Some people will take it as Tolkien playing up to the feminism side of things. Like, you're not, it's not, she's not a man, she's a woman. And so she gets to kill him. But people deeply must understand what's going on there. Um, first of all, the Witch King is hiding behind a prophecy. So in ages past, when he was uh, the Lord of Angmar and was in the process of destroying two of the realms of the Dunedain, and was successful in doing so. He he had defeated them. Um, but uh, then he was challenged by an, a combined elf, army of elves and men and um, was defeated but fled, was never defeated in one-on-one combat. Um, an, a prophecy was made about him by Glorfindel, who is one of the most powerful elves in Middle-earth, um, that by the hand of no man would he be slain. So you have this... Um, this witch king hiding behind a prophecy because his his point is you can't defeat me I can't be defeated by a man and he's talking of course about the genus man um, there and what what what's interesting about that whole scene is Tolkien's not playing into feminism there he is pointing out that that this is a lesson in arrogance the witch king is is arrogant in the extreme and believes he's basically untouchable. Um, and he's uh, Tolkien is showing that pride goeth before the fall, and so the the most humble of all the races of Middle Earth, Marietta Brandybuck, is the one that actually allows Eowyn to slay the Witch King. She can't do it actually, even if she's a woman, <laughs> um, Mer- because Marietta, although we don't see it, know it in the movie, has a blade from the Barrow Downs, because of course the Barrow Downs scene was cut from the movie. Barrow Downs, the men of the Barrow Downs forged these blades centuries and centuries ago specifically to destroy the magic of wraiths because their kingdom was being destroyed by the witch king and so they built these blades which were then buried with them which were specifically designed to destroy wraiths so witch king being a wraith mary mary stabs him in the back of the knee and it specifically says that his blade did the unbinding that knitted the flesh the unseen flesh of the witch king together so it actually is Mary that does the, the 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 primary work of slaying the witch king, and then Eowyn finishes him off. But really, what we're talking about here is a lesson in 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 um, arrogance and pride, not a lesson in feminism. Um, but I'm not surprised at people nowadays because they see everything through a, the the feminist lens. They're 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 going to try to pick that out. So that's the first thing. So I'll stop there because I've been. I know. On just one more thing on that because I want to talk about the conversation that she has with Aragorn. Uh, uh-huh. because that's an important moment as well. That's a clarifying moment. Right, right, good. So the re- the way the reason I say it's not feminism, even though she's saying she's not a man, is because, and Tolkien is not pro-feminist, is because we have, a, in fact, a very feminist ver- uh, argument that Eowyn has um, weeks before, I think it's weeks before, it's about a week before in the books, um, with Aragorn before Aragorn goes in the paths of the dead, and Eowyn is expressing to Aragorn that she wants to follow him into the paths of the dead. 
she's kind of got a crush on him in the first place, but also she wants to do it because she doesn't want to be left behind and not be able to enter battle. And she gives all the arguments, the pro-feminist arguments about why is it, it isn't fair that she um, be left behind as a woman and the men get to go off and fight. And Aragorn very gently but firmly corrects her and says, look, I'm, not, I'm badly paraphrasing because I'm not Tolkien, but he says, it's not because you're a woman that you can't go. It's because it's your duty. You have a duty as the daughter of the king who's given you a charge to take care of his people, and, and you must do your duty. We all must do our duty. And that's the reason why you can't go. And so this is Tolkien showing us, look, this whole thing about men versus women, not, that's not where it's at. That's not important. That's not what it's about. What it's about is responsibility. And with power comes responsibility. And I know that's been a Spider-Man line in, in, in the last couple um, um, decades, but it, has, it is a theme that underlies all of the ideas of noble virtue throughout the, the West, Western civilization, at least, but even, actually even a lot of Eastern civilizations, um, like the Japanese civilization, through, through history, is that power is burdened with responsibility, and you do, you're, you do not get to choose your life choices when you are, um, when you are uh, of a certain rank and, a, quote unquote, above others in a hierarchy. You actually have to serve. And so he calls, and so it's this whole responsibility versus feminism take, and Tolkien's clearly showing us which one he thinks is correct in that conversation. And I, I think, I think that it's, it's look, it, look, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, we both have strong women in our lives, and we, I mean, you have some very strong daughters. Mine are getting there, <laughs> right? Like they're getting Indeed. older. So, so it's not that we're anti-strong women, right? I mean, that's just not the case. Of course not. It's just, I think of that. Of course not. I think that everything is seems these days to to make women be like men to be strong, and that's just the falsehood. It's 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 ridiculous. Yeah, it goes and, back to what you were saying about about Galadriel. Same thing there. There's only one vision apparently. Uh, so Tolkien's just arguing against the vision of fem of a strong woman, which means that you know, strong woman means you must be in battle. That's what a strong woman is to be, and and. And he's pointing out, no, actually, there's other ways of showing strength. Yeah, that, well, of that. course, I mean, of course. And by the way, it doesn't mean that you can't be inspired by Tolkien in different ways. There are people that would read it and say, hey, listen, I do want to go off and I want to join the army or I want to do this and that. that that's fine. OK, like, like no one's saying that you can't do that. But I think this is the sad situation we're in right now in society where there is one way of being strong. Right. There's just one way. And we continually see like we never see these days the virtue of being a mother. We never see the virtue of supporting a husband in a situation like those things are just cast aside or, or worse than cast aside. They're, they're framed as being negative traits. That's right. And, that's, and, and that's just it, it's unbelievable. And I think that, again, when you look at all these different layers, it's super important to actually take things as the whole when you're looking at something like the Lord of the Rings because it's they're like it's like a game of Yanga, you know. You take one, which is which is by the way why Peter Jackson did such a great job, in my opinion, is you take one piece out and then you you don't find out until later on, right? That's made the structure all wobbly, uh, and because every single thread that Tolkien puts in that in that um, book, you're going to pick it up somewhere down the line. There's going to be a reference to it. It's going to yeah. have an impact. And that's why great writing is, is a real art because especially something that big, you know, that, that sprawling, uh, the creation of the worlds, the creation of the languages. And I, I think with Peter Jackson, again, I mean, film, so I know how difficult it is to create these kind of things and to take the world that he read and make it into a world that reflects accurately Tolkien's vision. Because he wasn't just like coming in and saying, okay, I'm going to tell the stories. He's going to tell the story over three films. He's got to cast it perfectly. He's got to make sure that the orcs look the way they look and 
even with the technology now, you look back and I mean, he actually started Weta, I think, for that. Or Weta he was did. a. That's a, right. I know. I know he'd done he'd done some um, special effects on the Frighteners and things like that. They're kind of like if you look at the ring rates and that, you can look at what happened in the Frighteners with the you know with the. Um, well, the especially ghosts. the armies of the dead, the army of the dead, and you look at the frighteners, you can see, yeah, you you can see a real a real parallel there. I agree, I agree. Yeah, and he um, and he yeah. he does a great job in I gotta creating say, like, that well, world. One of the things that struck me when uh, you were talking I mean, was you look back now and you can't is think of anyone sh- else. Sorry, go on. oh, I think we we uh, the technology mashed us <laughs> over each other there, but uh, okay. But uh, yeah, there, there's there's other virtues. There's not just one way to be strong. I want to add one last thing and point back to the hobbits. The hobbits, it is made absolutely clear in, by from the mouths of a variety of the wise and powerful in the book, no one could have borne the burden of the ring except the hobbits. These are the least powerful creatures in Middle Earth. And and they have a strength in them that's beyond the most powerful. They, Galadriel can't do it. Gandalf can't do it. Aragorn can't do it. Um, no one can resist the ring. And that'll lead, that leads me to your far mirror question. But no one can resist the ring except the, the, the least powerful. And so the one way to be... In a way, Frodo was the strongest cre- um, creature in Middle-earth. Um, and Tolkien's pointing out to us there's more than one way of being strong. Uh, there's more than one way of being powerful, and uh, and so so anyway, um, so along those lines, you had asked me earlier about Faramir, who, by the way, is my favorite character, um, and uh, we there, we have a joke inside of the super nerd community. We call we there's a difference. Peter Jackson, although he did a great job in general, um, we believe that he failed fairly significantly at the Faramir character, who was also Tolkien saw himself as. Most in the character of Faramir, he was asked in one of his letters, "Which character do you see yourself most as?" In, in the and he said Faramir. And it turns out Faramir is uh, he is himself an historian. He gives uh, Frodo and Sam like a, a summary history of the people of Gondor and Numenor, and he's so he, and he loves the language and he's he's basically he's like commentary guy. Like he's a great war hero too. He's he's in war, but he's but he but he sits there and you know he's a scholar and he's wise. Anyway. Faramir in the books does something that no other character is able to do. Not one, not even Frodo, actually, because Frodo is warned about the ring beforehand. Um, And that is that Faramir, in the books, when we get Faramir, he has, um, he's fought off uh, a whole... Um, invasionary force uh, that was joining, about to join Mordor of the Haradrim, the the sort of more southern folk um, that ride the elephants, the big elephant creatures, and he's he and his rangers of Athelion have killed them, and then they've saved the hobbits, and they've taken the hobbits. They don't know what the hobbits are though, and Faramir is not sure whether to trust them, so they've sort of captured the hobbits in a way, although they're, they're being treated well, and um, he's taken them to a hideout, one of the ranger hideouts in Athelion, and Faramir is picking up, even though Frodo's trying his best not to give up any any information, Faramir's picking up notes um, and pieces, bits and pieces, and he pieces it all together, and he literally figures out that Frodo has the ring, the one ring. And he, they're sitting in the cave, and they're surrounded in this hidden cave that the hobbits don't know their way out of, in this maze of caves, um, by all of Faramir's men. There's no way the hobbits are going to escape. Even if Frodo puts on the ring, he can't escape. Um, and Faramir realizes all of a sudden this hobbit has the weapon that my father is seeking and my brother went to to find out the mystery about the dream that came about it and and here it is and i could take it and in the movie jackson sadly in my opinion makes a choice to have faramir first decide to take the ring back to his father because in the movie far the movie faramir or as we nerds call it we call him filmamir there's faramir and there's filmamir <laughs> so filmamir um will uh will decides that you know his he's he's a, too, a little too much of a daddy's boy and he's he wants his father's approval and so he's going to take the ring back to his father to get his father's approval which he never had because daddy loved boromir more so that's filmamir and uh what follows is one of the silliest scenes from a 
from a um, movie perspective of all of the three films, which is like Frodo, they get halfway to Osgiliath and if Frodo's like holds out the ring and a nozzle comes down and like tries to grab him. And then at the last second, you know, you know, Sam tackles Frodo out of the clutches of the the fell beast. And then for some weird reason, the Nazgul on his fell beast ha- with Frodo with the ring right in front of him on the ground decides, well, I guess I've had enough. And he flies back to Mordor instead of like grabbing the one ring. It was so, it, and it's all contrived. So this is the, this is a low point for me plot wise. But the important part of that, most important part is, is that, um, Peter Jackson ruined the character of the man Faramir because what Faramir actually does in the book is when faced suddenly with the temptation of the ring, having no knowledge of it before, and all of a sudden it's here in front of him, and he can make his father happy and do his people proud and do what Boromir failed to do, um, which is bring the ring back to me as Tyr. If he can do it, he decides not to. And he, and, he, and he masters himself against the ring, and he gives Frodo supplies and directions and sends him on his way, even though it seems like a fool's errand to him. Um, so so this is this is like the ultimate test of the sons of men, um, and Faramir passes. Aragorn had passed that test earlier where Boromir failed, but Aragorn knew what the ring was beforehand, so he could fortify himself against that test. And so he, um, Faramir does what no other man did, and I think it's a shame that Jackson missed that opportunity in order to give us a more, a, what I believe is a lower version. Of why, why do you think he did that? Has he been asked that? Uh, I don't know, but I can tell you that he was leaning into the trope, with, and, he, and you can see it with um, Jackson's Aragorn, because he's leaning into the trope of the weakness of men. Do you remember that that um, you know er, Elrond or Agent Smith, as I call him? Um, mm-hmm. uh, spouts a bu- bunch of lines about how he has seen the weakness of men, you know, the the strength of men, and how it fails. And because he was there on the day that Isildur failed to destroy the ring, and Aragorn struggles. A- Aragorn, in the, not in the books, in the movies, Aragorn struggles with his lineage and feels himself weak and, and unworthy to take the crown. Um, and so I just think he was leaning into the weakness of men. What is Faramir's weakness? Well, in the book. Faramir actually does very much want his father to love him, and it does wound him that his father chooses Faramir from. But the difference is, book Faramir doesn't let that keep him from doing what's right, what he knows to be right, even though he very much he's human and he very much wants his father's love. Um, and and so so the difference is that I think Jackson was leaning into uh, Faramir's. You know, he sees that like this is a way that Faramir could be weak because he wants to show all men as weak, basically. Hmm. Or, you know, and you know, you even see it from the, by the way, brilliant line from Galadriel at the very beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring, where she's telling about the history of the rings, and she says, you know, she gives the line of, um, in the movies, she gives the line of, you know, and nine r- rings were given to 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 men who above all things desire power. That's her line, um, from the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring, and I think. Um, Jackson chose a theme and he ran with it, and that was like the weakness and corruptibility of men. So sadly, it, it uh, one of Tolkien's best characters got ruined in that moment. But uh, did he film have it? it. Did, 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 did he film it though? Did he film the scene in the cave? Do you know, because I mean, he, he filmed a lot of stuff. Uh, he he, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know if he. So in the un, in the extended edition they are in a cave and they're, they're they do they do um have a, have the discussion but they don't but faramir chooses the wrong path he chooses to take him to back to his father so so there's i mean they're in the cave there's a it's a beauty it's a cool scene but um yeah they don't they don't uh they, they reverse his character in the, in the well, i mean i can i you know look i mean not that i mean to defending anyone i mean i, I understand as I said before, the filmmaking process, and and I think right. that it's very difficult. I mean, I've directed a movie, I've produced a few movies, and it's when you come to that moment, it's very, very difficult to make the choice of what you're going to cut. And you know, the only thing that I can think about, uh, or think of, that he was he was thinking then, and again, I don't know, I'm not Peter Jackson, but. A lot of the time in today's movies, you don't have anyone overcoming any weakness 
right? So it's a very it's, it's a very floor, common right? thing to say, okay, well, this person has a flaw and he's going to overcome that flaw later on. Uh, again, I mean, that might be um, a little bit simple. You might be right. It might be a little bit simple, you know, and it also might be, well, hang on a minute. If if I've, like, weakened Aragorn, then I can't really have this other guy come through as the hero of the piece, right? I don't know. I'm, Maybe. I'm just – because I'm so, I feel so grateful that we got the films that we got – considering how bad i mean that's where we are right now right that these movies can be such disasters because people come in and they go that tolkien guy he doesn't really know what he was talking about you know and it so i when we spoke about that the other night i found that really fascinating because it's just a reason to read the material right it's it's you have to read the material with these things and i can understand the the real Tolkien diehards, they're like, Wah. but I think now we're getting to the point where the majority of fans look back and they go, we were really lucky to get what we got considering the way the movie industry is going. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. And let me, I mean, let me be clear, in an age in which the cool thing is to do Rage Monkey on everything, you have to be all of one side or all of another. Let me say that the Peter Jackson films, I believe, were fantastic. I love them. I've watched them many, many times. I have the extended edition. We have a rule in our house. We're not allowed to watch the regular edition. We can only watch the extended editions. So, yes, we watch the four-hour version of Return of the King because it's awesome. Um, but there's a... There is um, there's a desire in our culture nowadays, especially in the era, age of the internet and clickbait, to be got to be all in on one side or all in another. I the Jackson films were fantastic. I love them. I will show them all the time. And yet, and they have their flaws, and they will never live up to the book. So, like you said, like just like the, the part that I mentioned about the blade of Mary being the key to taking out the Witch King. Nobody knows that who hasn't read the book because it wasn't in it yeah. at all. Um, cause he, cause Jackson had to take out a big chunk with the Barrow Downs and the old forest and Tom Bombadil, which all went together because Tom Bombadil was the one that saved them from the Barrow Downs. So he took out everything there. And then, so you, now you don't have the significance of that blade that Mary uses to stab the back of the Witch King and unbind his magical, um, um But still that... you've got a four hour movie if exactly. you really wanted to. And, and that's the extended cut, by the way, I was going to. <laughs> I saw it on I saw it on the TV the other day, and I sat. I, I looked around all the kids, and I was like, "Ah, oh, no, you, you're not going to sit through four hours of Lord of the Rings like that. That would actually like ruin you. Like you would not want to watch it. But it's there for when they're older. So again, I've been in that situation. I know what it's like to get an edit. I know what it's like yep. to. And to, they had to make their choices. That they have to make their choice is very, very difficult. And I don't, and I don't it, blame them for it. I don't, I don't. They're not evil for it. I think they did a fantastic job. I just encourage people read the books because you'll get even more out of the books. Well, that's the point, right? I mean, even with a four-hour movie like Return of the King, you're still not getting all of it. And it it is one of those things where I mean, it's not even like you get the cliff notes with a regular movie. You get deep, you know, you get a good slice of it. It's not superficial they do retain the depth of the books like it is a good reflection of the books and, it totally and, is um there's just so much I'll, to the books that you can do a have a movie like that and there can still be more to read so so yeah i would and and this is why i wanted to talk about it because i think that a lot of people love the books i mean i i mean I look back and I watch the films recently again, like I did my, I did, I'm going through my, um, my, uh, movie series, you know, so I, I went through Lord of the Rings and then I, I just went through Rocky. We haven't gone. Nice. We've got to four. We haven't done five and six, um, which we will, but the kids, you know, I get up and they're playing the music in the background and, you know, when they're doing the, their chores, you know, they're playing Eye of the Tiger and I love it. And, I think it's very, very important for people to understand how vital it is that kids read good material and watch good material. And it's also important that that people invest in the culture 
and part of that is that there's a whole generation. I mean, it's difficult to believe, you know, that, that I mean, I did Black Hawk Down 20 odd years ago, and those movies are 20 years old, and they don't look it to be. I actually think, and Graham McTavish is a very good friend of mine who was in The Hobbit, and I actually think The Lord of the Rings look way better. It looks way better than The Hobbit. As as a as a piece of filmmaking, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't think it's anywhere. Yeah, yep. We haven't talked about the Hobbit films, and we will not because I yeah. do. The, the, Hobbit, the Hobbit films were just such a downslide from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, look again. I don't want to talk about anything that my friends have been in, uh, in any kind of derogatory way. Um, I mean, I would love to have done them. It doesn't matter how bad they turned out, but I just think that that. Those movies, I don't think there'll be a movie series like them again. I genuinely don't. I think that they are going to stand as the benchmark. I think they're probably the greatest franchise of all time. You know, wow. I mean, the, I really do. I mean, it's certainly the the greatest trilogy of all time. Yep. I don't think there's anything to touch them. Well, uh, I don't. I, I think their source material stands head and shoulders above anything else. So, what are you so, going to do with that, right? I mean, it really is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yep, agreed, one hundred percent. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I agree with you about Black Hawk Down and some of the others. Those were movies. They're just they're they're still awesome movies, and they're not even still awesome in, as in like you know, sure they're 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 old, and we can see the flaws. I like Black Hawk Down is a movie that's that. Not only stands the test of time, it's head and shoulders above ninety eight percent of the movies nowadays, probably hundred percent of the movies nowadays. Um so so yeah, it just you just uh we, we do seem to have reached a kind of a little bit of a summit. I don't know if it's right, the yeah, summit yeah. of movie making, but there was a there was a summit that was reached and and um the over reliance on high on technology and the CGI stuff nowadays and then the injection of politics. It's not made movies better, I'll tell you that. It's not. I mean, it's, again, I think it's lazy filmmaking. I think that relying on the, you know, bells and whistles takes away from the real stories. And the problem being is you have individuals that are coming in the make, making movies that are just talentless, so that they got promoted there with no or little, very little merit. And what you're seeing is the real skillful people and the talented people, like, I can't deal with this anymore. And they're bugging out. And you're seeing the quality of the movies drop, 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 drop. And and that's sad. It's, it actually gives an opportunity, Michael, for other people to invest in film, which I keep going on about, like invest in film right now. You can get Good some point. amazing talent uh, and do a really great job. I mean, again... I do want to go back just quickly, and then we'll leave it on this. But I love the idea of the other worlds, mm. the, Tol the uh, Tolkien's other worlds that they didn't explore. That is such a missed opportunity, indeed. Right to to go and do whatever you want to do. Like you could you could do a completely, you know, um, subculture, another another world you know, that was maybe Asian or maybe black or whatever exactly. it is and, and build exactly. out that whole, that whole world. And, and what happened, you know, well, why weren't they involved or were they involved when all these other things were going on that we didn't see this whole world. And that there's a whole uh, different angle that you could take on it that people would absolutely love and it wouldn't conf conflict at all. No. With what what they've already got, I mean, no, it exactly. just seems you know, so for, lazy. Let me give you one quick example of that. So, in the Tolkien Legendarium, the the race of dwarves had there were seven first dwarves that were created by Aule, the master. He's like a think of him like an archangel or something in Tolkien's uh, cosmology, and so he he creates them. He's trying to imitate. Iluvatar, who's God in the, in the Middle Earth, he's trying to eliminate. He's trying to imitate the creation of Luvatar, but he can't. Only only Iluvatar can give actual life. But out of mercy, Iluvatar does, and he allows the dwarves to be a race and live. There are seven forefathers of the dwarves. All the dwarves that we know about that are in all of Tolkien stories come from one of those seven. The others of them spread across Middle Earth. There's 
there you could have stories like the whole thing about for example african american dwarfs or black dwarfs right um in the in the i was it wouldn't be african american would be black because um, the actress was or was she i think she was british yeah so so but but there could actually be a race of black dwarves you know in another part of the mm-hmm. world that would have been awesome to explore i th- i think that would be really cool to see that one of the forefathers of the dwarves was you know, had darker skin and then they were there have a whole race of dwarves that live in the deserts of, Har- of harad except or something like that that would be i mean like there's so much room in tolkien's world to really exercise your imagination and if you want to explore other ethnic uh, style cultures awesome nobody has and by the way you could also talk about a lot of these things a lot of these social issues yep that are legitimate right like you could say well you know why did they why did they go split off who was the who was the aggressor what was the misunderstanding or was it really uh bad blood did someone do something to piss off the other guys or was it prejudice or what, you know, whatever it is, so many you stories can tackle to told, that. Yeah. And that, that is great. I think that the, the, the issue isn't, it really gets to me when it's certainly in the star Wars um, universe, they do this a lot and they do obviously doing it in Marvel as well. Nobody is saying that you cannot tackle these subjects, right? Because these subjects are universal. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's you know the 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 different elements in Middle Earth, right? Because that's what he's he's talking about. I mean, there's clearly different um, races right, in there. You, you you I mean, and they're very defined. It's not just like the color of their skin, right? It's the way they look. It's their size. It's, it's actual it's, culture. It's not it's, it's not just this one aspect of kid skin color, but they have entirely different cultures and histories and heroes and politics and it's all and their and ways of of of. Of economies and way you know lifestyles it, you could have explored any of that That's and it, and that is that is absolutely fascinating to me and i i think that it's very lazy again very and it's a cheap shot at people when they go hey hang on a second i don't want that in in this right, right. what they're not saying is i don't want it overall they're just saying it's it's kind of like having a nice yard right and someone coming along and going i want to put a swimming pool in and you're like, well, uh, I don't want it in my yard. Right. I'd love a swimming pool, but I don't want it there, right? right? Because that's not the right place for it. I can have it somewhere else, but I don't want it in my yard, in my front yard, because that's where my roses are. That my grandpa, wh- whatever it is, whatever whatever reason, that's the aesthetic that you had there. But you're not adverse to having it somewhere else. And what they do, which is really sloppy, is be, it's kind of like you know they say like uh, every heresy has an element of truth in it, right? And so what they do is they'll, they'll get the truth of a character and just spin it a little bit, just just that little mm-hmm. bit. And the purists understand what they're doing. They know. And they're like, no, you cannot do that. Because with, with, with those kind of things that are deeply thought out and planned and, and in a movie, not in a movie, in a book, like Lord of the Rings, where every single step of it is meticulous, it's he's he's gone through to the point of creating languages you can't mess with that because it's like you go one degree off you end up miles away at the end right if you're going on a long journey you end up miles and miles away from your target so you can go off and you can do your own thing and that's fine as long as you respect the what has already been created i mean if can you imagine if they did like you said they did a spin-off and you know it was the dwarf wars or whatever it is and that you know the two brothers and they split what what whatever that might what whatever kind of like dynamic you want and then you have gimli turn up or whatever you know they they turn up in that world and all of a sudden you unite the world i mean that would be an absolute bombshell and everyone would love it exactly no one would have a problem with that None, none at all. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't even throw Gimli actually in there because he and Legolas do not literally these... throw him, right? Because there's a whole thing about throwing <laughs> Apparently there's Gimli. There's a problem with that, right? But he and Legolas <laughs> did go on these long travels after the end of Lord of the Rings, so you could even have them in the East. You could have them show up in different places. Like th- there could be such great stories told that would not contradict. And really, what it comes down to, it goes back to what I mentioned at the beginning, where um, Tolkien had a had a view about how to write good fantasy and or sub creation, as he called it, and 
in order for you to actually subcreate, he had to, he, he actually said, you have to move beyond, beyond the level of suspension of disbelief. People talk about that a lot. They're like, if you have a bad movie, then um, and characters that don't make sense and dialogue if you, if, if that's crappy, um, it, it destroys your suspension of disbelief. Okay, fair enough. For Tolkien, that was level one like you you start out at the at the level of terrible storytelling where no one believes anything then you can get to le- suspension of disbelief which is another level but what he's talking about is a third level which is subcreation and he, he says the mark of subcreation is that you've made a world that's so well crafted that people don't have to even suspend their disbelief they're once the, when they're in the world the the world is real to them and not in some faux, you know, I I mistake this world for the real world and I'm gonna jump off buildings because I think I could fly crap. Um it's it's the they're in that world and they're actually in it and they're enjoying it, the richness of it, and and they know it's an imaginative world, but they're in it and they don't have to like, well, I'm gonna suspend disbelief and there can really I know in the real world there can't be magic, but I'm gonna pretend there can be in this one. It's just Magic comes from the nature of the elves. Magic comes from the nature of Gandalf, and it's believable. And it's not, it's not, you know, whiz bang crap. Um, and so he, what he would say about that is, if you're going to take my world or anyone's world, and you're going to tell another story, but then you're just going to throw in your random thing of like, here's dwarves, or let, let me give you a good example. Um, my co-host and I, the uh, tribe of hobbits or proto hobbits, which they. They pretended it was okay that they didn't call them hobbits and didn't thereby breach any any contractual rights because they called them Harfoots in the in the Rings of Power. They said there's this tribe of wandering Harfoots, which any Tolkien um, uh, aficionado knows is hilariously stupid because Tolkien says in the opening of his first book that there are three subspecies of hobbits, one of which is the Harfoots. So when you call them Harfoots, you're just calling them hobbits. So you, I don't even know how any lawyers signed off on that being okay, but whatever. So you got these Harfoots, and they're in this tribe, and, and you're going to tell me that there's a wandering tribe of hobbits who stay away from everybody else, but they stick together, and they wander the land, and they've done so for generations, but they keep to themselves, and they're, they're going through, and all they do is they keep to themselves and hide from everybody else and, and stay out of everyone else's world, but somehow they're all different races genetically? Like, do you understand how tribes work? Like, you're, that's such a stupid idea that, you know, everyone knows, doesn't matter what your skin color is, tribes, by their nature, if they move and stay together, they they all end up looking the same. They're homogeneous. Yeah, because they're, Be- it's a tribe. They're, exactly, they're the one exactly. family, basically. You marry everyone in, genetically, you end up looking the same. Doesn't matter what that same means, whether it's Viking tribes or sub-Saharan African tribes. You end up looking the same. And so the idea that there's a tribe that sticks together and never, you know, clean, it's not even like they meet other tribes that all look different. It's like one tribe and they're all marrying each other and they all look like the rainbow of New York City. And, and, it's, and it's such a stupid thing that it just takes you right out of any, any real subcreation. You're just... You're just you're now in the world of you know just some sort of um, um, you know uh, fiction. But again, some soap Mike, opera Mike it, it, it's just it's laziness. It's it's lazy. And look, that's right. That's right. I'll be honest with you. I understand if you are a writer and someone comes in and they say we're going to do the Rings of Power, and you're going to be like, "Holy crap!" Like because there, there's nothing high. I mean, the Bible is there anything that's higher than that? That's right. Right. I mean, so you can either say, you know what? And I'm sure a bunch of people did, by the way. I'm sure a bunch of people said, I'm passing. That's that's too much for me, right? Because not only has Peter Jackson come in and nailed it, right? Apart from Faramir, Philomir, right? Apart from him. And and a couple of things. But he's nailed it. He did a great job. And you got to come in. And we're supposed to improve on this? <laughs> yeah, and, and so it, the, what they did was a very unimaginative, predictable, tropey way of um, of Im- improving on the material. So that's a good way to put it. I, I think that again, it's 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 smacks of laziness, probably a little bit of an intimidation, and also, I think the great thing about it was New Line Cinema, I think, that did. Um, did Lord of the Rings, they right. allowed him to do his job, right? They allowed right, him to go and create the world. 
it was just going to be one movie or two, and he wouldn't do it. He would. He said it has to be three, and uh, yeah, New Line let him. So, so yeah, and I, so he I created. He, he had to have the weight, and and this is part of the problem. And this is, and I'm I'm telling you guys that are watching this right now is why I keep saying subscribe. Is that you have to have a relative amount of power to be able to make your vision come to come to reality right you have to right and as a filmmaker you have, to have to, that's right yeah you and you, look I, I always say i mean you know me you've known me for a long time i'm actually a very collaborative person but you have to be a benevolent dictator when you're making a movie <laughs> yep that's what it is you, you do else it'll never get made and then you get especially right now when you get a bunch of accountants that come in and they think they know what they're talking about and they have no clue whatsoever and this is why you see these movies that are made by committee and they're just terrible because nobody wants to offend anyone. Everyone's looking around going, is HR going to come in and tell us that we've got to do, you know, hit this diversity quote so or whatever. True. And, and it, it, all it does is it sets people up for failure. And I was really disappointed with, look, wh whenever I've gone out, mainly whenever I've gone out on movies, I talk about the character. I talk about, what I'm doing, what the movie means. And certainly when I did Black Hawk Down, which was playing someone who was real, um, you had to be super, super aware of your tone, the way you carried yourself. You wanted that person. And, and I've spoken, you know, I've texted Dale Sizemore. We, we haven't met yet properly. I was going to go to the, um, the um, anniversary of, of the real event uh, and I couldn't do, um, you know, we have kids, they do stuff. I was invited to it. But I knew that I had to take the role seriously and be respectful of that individual and his family and of the people that died and the legacy of that mission. And that was very, very, very important to me. And I feel that that all the actors on Lord of the Rings felt that. I know that Orlando did. I know we did because I was I was with him. They took it very seriously, right? Um, well, and I've heard and, a lot of the interviews. They did, in fact, and but that's the difference, Matthew, between what you're talking about, where um, you are an actor who wants to show respect towards the subject that you're that you're portraying, and the actors in Lord of the Rings wanted the same. Peter Jackson, as a director, wanted the same, versus the actors that believe, and you can tell by the way they talk about it in their actions. Like they think of themselves as the highest, the, as the pinnacle of what's going on in the film, and not and not the character that they're playing, or in the case of Black Hawk Down, or the real person that they're playing. So yeah, uh, I don't I mean, know if it's like that's it's what indicative. Actors... Yeah, I, I don't know if it's indicative of like you know what is it, Gen Zs or, or millennials right now. I mean, you know, we know it's a battle <clears throat> for kids to mm. to let them maintain their humility. Uh, when everyone thinks True. that they're YouTube stars and oh, and um, right, is it an influencer? Instagram. Everyone wants to be an influencer. Everyone wants to be an influencer, but have no real skills. You know, they they want to come on and and for whatever reason, I don't know. And but, fair enough. Yeah, you know, and just for the people that are that actually made it to this point, they're thinking, well, but aren't you on YouTube? Well, yeah. So, but the difference is that I and my co-host co had decided that we would we were going to aim for having the lowest and smallest audience ever that ever existed on a podcast. So, we are doing Matthew no favors by um, by by appearing on your well, show. Well, the sad thing is, is you got more subscribers than me, so I'm beating you <laughs> uh, at that. You've so been really, around, you've been around it, for a month, so uh, yeah, it, we've been around for a year and a half. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but I, I do think. And again, it's different. I would never have come and done a YouTube channel if people hadn't been bugging me for three or four years. And you know that. I mean, you know that that's the truth. And yep. and secondly, if people would have left me alone as an actor, you never heard a peak from me. If people didn't try and pursue me in certain manners to to you know you can't talk about it on YouTube, but you know do certain things then you I wouldn't be doing this to be quite frank I'll be off like you know living my life with the kids but but I do think that and my son has said this to me multiple times and he's one of the reasons why I'm doing the podcast he's like dad you know you should go out and say this because there's a lot of people out there that aren't hearing it they're not they don't understand and, and we have it in our in our minds because and I want to tell the people that watch like 
you know, apart from when I beat Michael at Catan. Uh, that's, I that's cannot a, believe that's a little bit of an in, in joke, by the way. <laughs> and it's a bit of an in joke, but but we when we sit around and talk, it's never trivial, right? It's it's always substantive. It's always about different things. It can bounce around. Like we we are going to talk uh, on the next podcast I do with Michael. We're going to talk about a little bit more about the Crusades and about medieval history because I think a lot of people have have bought into the lies and the straw man arguments about that. So we're going to talk about that in the next one. But I think it's it's important because that's the life that I live in. I'm very, very lucky to be around with around a bunch of people that are much smarter than me and are, are experts in different in different things. So I get to ask a lot of questions and get a lot of very, very interesting answers. And I realize that not everyone has that. And that I am blessed uh, with a great set of friends and a, and a great bunch of people that I know. Um, well, well, I'm not going to let you leave it there because what I what I will tell you, Matthew, is that uh, this there's a through line between what you do and what we've been talking about with Tolkien. And that through line is what is truly the oldest profession. There's a joke about prostitution being the oldest profession. The oldest actual profession is storyteller in the world. You can see it in the Bible, um, and and you see it and with the popularity of movies. And the person that can tell a good story, and this is why what we're talking about is serious. You know, we spent uh, in probably inordinate amount of time talking about uh, <laughs> fantasy world this in the last hour, but but in a way not because like with Shakespeare, like with the work of Tolkien, like with the epics of the past, storytelling in is it gets at the themes of what means the most, what hits the heart of the human heart the most. And actors um, are you're you're the front line to that. If, if people if without actors you can't tell a compelling story. Um, on, on in real life, I mean, you can tell one in a book, but but you can't tell one on the stage or on the fi on film um, in the, on the internet. And so there's there's this core need for people that are good storytellers. Which I, having watched your movies and and um, which both which you the ones you started in as well as the ones you directed, I can tell you you you're you, you're that in spades. And so we need those those storytellers. Storytellers are a boon and. I might know a lot of things about dead people in medieval history, but I can't tell a story. So I, we, there, there's a um, there's great um, balance that's needed, and the art of storytelling is a real art. And I think we're kind of losing it a little bit in our mm -hmm. culture we, um, now. And and I, I agree with you 100 percent that we want the revival. We want the people to come back in. There's now a void to be filled in that art of good storytelling, and uh, we're hoping that we can see a little revival. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And I think that it starts with, as I've said over and over and over again, it's very important to have a platform. It's very important to people for people to understand that there's a market for it and that it can be done and it can be done in an excellent manner. Because I think part of part of the, the issue that we've had in recent years, certainly in the independent film realm, or the what it says conservative film realm, because a lot of people don't want to watch what a lot of the very extreme liberal leftists are putting out on film because it's just that they don't tell stories anymore. It's just purely agenda driven. And I think that right, they're preaching, they're preaching you know, at you. They're not telling stories. They're totally preaching and, and people don't want to buy it. You know, they don't want to hear that. It's, it is entertainment. Now, the funny thing is, is if you say, look, it's entertainment, it doesn't mean that it, it cannot tackle like very serious issues or exactly. it, it's not moving or what, whatever it might be. It stirs your heart, uplifts you, whichever, whichever way you want to look at that. But it's done in a skillful way. And, it's, and it has to be about and, and contain things that really matter to someone. And that's very, that's very different to kind of hammering and squishing in some kind of agenda, some kind of, and it's mainly political agenda, uh, because people know that that's fake. You, you can tell a story um, that has those issues that come up that are challenging. Like we're saying, like if you were to do this spin-off of Lord of the Rings, if they, if they hadn't done the Rings of Power like that, and they'd done it where it was an alternate world, uh, or, or the same world, sorry, but, you know, a, an different alternate part of the world, country, yep. a different part of the world, 
then you could address all kinds of different things, like even to the point of why aren't they, why aren't these stories known? And someone could say, well, you know, to the victor, uh, go the spoils, right? And the victors all, always write the history. And it might be, luckily, you know, we were we did all this work over here, but you never heard about it. I don't know. I mean, th there's a whole load of things that you could go into, but but really what is important is story. So unfortunately, at the end of the show, I had some technical difficulties. It happens and I lost Michael. So I want to thank him again for coming on and furnishing us with all this information about Tolkien. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I'm going to get him back to talk about medieval history in particular, the truth about the Crusades, because there's been a lot of lies and strawman arguments put out there about the Crusades, and we're just going to clear that up. So thank you once again for watching the show. I really, really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe. Please share it. Get people to subscribe. I know I keep going on about it, but it really matters. I want to thank you again for all your support. And remember, not all actors are like this. I promise.